Okay, now it says we're live. Woohoo! Good morning. Good morning. And it's great to be live. It's great to be alive at the same time. Um, I'm Brian. I'm the pastor at Christ United Methodist Church here in Waynesboro, PA. We sit just above the uh, PA Maryland border, just two miles basically from, uh, from Maryland. Uh, lovely community. Great to be here, and great to be here online with you folks this morning. We've uh, Today is Wednesday, December 23rd. We've been working our way through the Gospel of Luke, reading one chapter a day. We started on December 1st, um, which is uh, a good place, you know, a good day to start. And uh, by starting on December 1st, we're going to finish tomorrow because there are 24 chapters in the Gospel of Luke. Um, so, and tomorrow's the 24th, so we're going to finish up tomorrow, um, and uh, which is also Christmas Eve, by the way, just in case you didn't know. Um, I'm going to be taking a break. I appreciate the comments and stuff and the support. It sounds like you folks have been enjoying these, um, learning from them, which is great. Being challenged by them in some ways, which is uh, perhaps even better. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'm probably going to do something else after this, but I'm uh, probably going to take a little bit of a break anyway. Not sure uh, how long of a break. Maybe just a couple days. Maybe maybe a week. We might might wait until next year to uh, to start up with something new. Just not sure. Uh, I do have a couple different thoughts uh, of what to do. One is uh, to to take a look at the Book of Acts, uh, which is presumably anyway uh, from the same author as Luke. And doing a chapter a day on that, and taking a look at the early church, um, and uh, you know and that that story. Acts is a book that uh, I I think we tend to ignore a lot of times. We might read it in passing, um, and in uh, in worship services, we might read it um, just for informational purpose kind of thing. Not. Not, not spend a whole lot of time on it. So that might be a good one. Um, another option, uh, I'm going to, uh, almost done reading through the Bible this year. I read it through uh, every year based on a, a plan. Um, been doing that for a few years now. And so I'll be starting a new plan uh, January 1st. Uh, I could always do that with you. We can read the Bible together for, uh, during the year. Uh, problem with that, it would be that it'd be, you know, four or five chapters a day. Definitely wouldn't have time to do any uh, any uh, any commentary uh, on it. Um, we would just be reading through those, those books uh, together, which is fine. We just, uh, you'd, and maybe you'd prefer that. You wouldn't have to listen to me talk as much with my, with my, uh, my theories and commentary on it. Um, or maybe there's another book of the Bible that you would like to go through. Uh, I'm open to suggestions. I would be glad to uh, to consider uh, whatever you might uh, might comment, uh, whatever you might say about that. So you can leave a message here, or you can uh, text me five seven zero three five one one six one nine. That goes for any questions also that pop up with uh, with today's reading, um, or you can shoot me an email with uh, with your comments your suggestions for for what to do next anyway here we go i'm going to look at uh, chapter 23 the penultimate chapter uh, penultimate fancy word i know uh, it's one of those crossword puzzle words uh, or clues anyway meaning next to last next to last the ultimate would be the last the penultimate is the next last. So here you go with the penultimate chapter. If you learn nothing else today, you've learned what that word means, right? Chapter 23, and uh, this is Jesus's um, the trial, and Luke packs a lot into this one chapter, and, and yes, I know he didn't actually write them as chapters. Uh, somebody else decided where chapters begin and end and sometime in the Middle Ages, um, but uh, he packs a lot into this section of his, of his writing and we've got jesus jesus was arrested yesterday's readings um and uh, today is his trial his crucifixion and burial entombment we might say <clears throat> so we're going to get started here 
uh, chapter 23, verse 1, the whole assembly got up and led Jesus to Pilate and began to accuse him. They said, we have found this man misleading our people, opposing the payment of taxes to Caesar and claiming that he is the Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, that's what you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no legal basis for action against this man. But they objected strenuously, saying, he agitates the people with his teaching throughout Judea, starting from Galilee all the way here. So pause. Um, Luke, Luke is very uh, definitive. He's very, he's uh, with who's responsible for for what's taking place with Jesus. He seems to absolve uh, Pilate, at least at this point, of responsibility, uh, stating that Pilate finds him innocent. Uh, um, Luke, and Luke Luke affirms that again with Pilate and also with Herod. We're gonna we're gonna hear that. So Luke seems to be very you know just like pounding away on a couple different facts. The innocence of Jesus. This this whole thing is a sham. Uh, he is innocent of, of anything, and uh, that's being affirmed by several different individuals. Um, also, that uh, Pilate and Herod, although they themselves find him innocent, are almost pawns of the system, okay? Those are a couple things that Luke seems to be hammering away at in, in, this, in this passage. Hearing this, that, that is, hearing that Jesus was from Galilee, it says he started in Galilee and worked his way down here. Now, Pilate is governor of Judea, which would be Jerusalem and the surrounding territories of it. You get a little bit farther north, uh, you get a different province, region, whatever you want to call it, uh, the area of Galilee, and that's where Herod is governor. So their their territories don't overlap, they're, but they butt up next to each other. We don't know a lot about their relationship. Luke says that they were enemies until now. We're going to get to that, that part. Um, we really don't know a lot about their relationship from, uh, from history, um, but presumably they didn't really like each other. You know, maybe it was a you know, a political and power grabbing kind of thing that they mistrusted each other. <clears throat> anyway, but hearing that Jesus is actually from Galilee, from Herod's territory, he tries to brush it off and send it back to him. So hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was from Herod's district, Pilate sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Herod was very glad to see Jesus, for he had heard about Jesus and had wanted to see him for quite some time. He was hoping to see Jesus perform some sign. A brief aside, remember from a couple weeks ago, uh, Herod, Luke said that about Herod, that Herod wanted to meet Jesus. I said he was foreshadowing this moment right here, and it's not the kind of meeting that Herod had intended, and it goes far different than Herod wanted, and we'll see. He was hoping to see Jesus perform some sign. Herod questioned Jesus at length, but Jesus didn't respond to him. The chief priests and the legal experts were there, fiercely accusing Jesus. Herod and his soldiers treated Jesus with contempt. Pa uh, aside, hey, you won't do what I want, you're just a, you're nothing. Herod mocked him by dressing Jesus in elegant clothes and sent him back to Pilate. Pilate and Herod became friends with each other that day. Before this, they had been enemies. We really don't know that, just what Luke says. <laughs> then Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. He said to them, you brought this man before me as one who was misleading the people. I have questioned him in your presence and found nothing in this man's conduct that provides a legal basis for the charges you have brought against him. Neither did Herod, because Herod returned him to us. He's done nothing that deserves death. Therefore, I'll have him whipped and let him go. 
So, pause. See, again, the innocence. Both Herod and Pilate say he's, he's innocent. You know, this is ridiculous. Trumped up charges. Returning to the story. But with one voice, they shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison because of a riot that had occurred in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them again because he wanted to release Jesus. They kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time, Pilate said to them, why? What wrong has he done? I found no legal basis for the death penalty in his case. Therefore, I will have him whipped then let him go. But they were adamant, shouting their demand that Jesus be crucified. Their voices won out. Pilate issued his decision to grant their request. He released the one they asked for, who had been thrown into prison because of a riot and murder, but he handed Jesus over to their will. Pause. We don't know how many people were there. You know, there's been arguments, or, or not arguments, but contrary opinions that, oh, it couldn't have been a very large crowd. It wasn't a large space. Um, these are different people. They're not the real people of, of the community. Whatever. It, it's probably simplest to say they were real people from the community. Yeah, the same. some of the same ones who just a few days before had welcomed Jesus into uh, the city with such wonderful announcements. <clears throat> And we're now calling for his, for his blood, for his death. It really wasn't uncommon in first century to have such uh, eruptions of, of bloodlust, perhaps because of public executions being relatively common, um, perhaps because it was something exciting to stir up the day, whatever reason, it, it Looking at historical documents, it, it was common. It was a pretty common thing. And it seems that that's what's taking place in, in this passage here. The crowd is, is the bloodlust is rising, and they want something. And Pilate does give in. Um, Luke, Luke seems to think that Pilate was fairly innocent with this, just kind of a political pawn and was afraid of a riot breaking out and so he gave in and surrendered Jesus to their will. Now the person that uh, was released <clears throat> in lieu of Jesus, Luke refers to as Barabbas. Uh, Math Mark also just calls him Barabbas. Matthew uh, actually says he was known as Jesus Barabbas. Interesting, interesting. Um, in fact, Matthew says, uh, do you want me to release Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? Now, Jesus, the word, the name Jesus, uh, was not... Mm, <laughs> our Jesus wasn't the only Jesus. I guess is how I'm going to say that. It wasn't a purely, I mean, it wasn't a, a really um, uncommon name. It was, a, it was a relatively common name. It was a good name. It was a good name. Now, Jesus itself is, is Greek. The Hebrew equivalent would be Joshua. Hebrew, Hebrew equivalent is Joshua. So, was Jesus Jesus or was he Joshua? Um, they both mean the same thing. They both mean God saves. And so this this other guy, this other Jesus, or Matthew calls him Jesus anyway, Barabbas, is also known as God saves. The, the other part of his name, even if we just go by the Barabbas part, um, and I, I think it's actually Aramaic, not, not Hebrew, Bar Abbas means son of God. Um, so I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that one because there's sermons in that passage right there. Um, so we have Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, and we have Jesus, Barabbas, <laughs> Son of God. 
I, I just find that interesting. Um, but I'm sure I'll be preaching on that at some point. <clears throat> so continuing, better get moving here because I'm only halfway through the chapter and we're 15 minutes into this. <laughs> As they led Jesus away, they grabbed Simon, a man from Cyrene, who was coming in from the countryside. They put the cross on his back and made him carry it behind Jesus. Pause. Um, you know, criminals were usually forced to carry their own cross. Now, we might have images of you know, fancy, clean-shaven wood and stuff like that. In most cases, the cru crucifixions didn't take place like that. They really just took place on a tree. Uh, and it would have been a, you know, yeah, a cross beam of some form, maybe not straight across, maybe bent and twisted and all that kind of stuff, uh, a sturdy branch of a tree that was, that they carried uh, to the other tree to be nailed there to a tree. That, that's more into a hole and lift it up. Um, but criminals were usually forced to carry their own cross piece in some way. But Jesus has been beaten and, and whipped. And, uh, you know, the tradition expands on this story. And that's all. We're only given that little bit. Tradition expands on the story that he tripped and fell a couple times. Uh, maybe the guards, the soldiers were getting tired of uh, the slow pace. Um, that he wasn't going to be able to do it on his own. So they grabbed this other guy, which was... A common practice, you know, if you wanted somebody to do something, if you were a Roman soldier, and you wanted somebody to do something, they had to do it. You can just uh, force them to. So they forced this guy to do it. We don't know anything about uh, this Simon of Cyrene other than this little reference. Tradition has him become a, a, a bishop of the early church in, in some area. A huge crowd of people follow Jesus, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. Uh, pause. We don't know which women. Most likely, though, some of his some of his devoted followers, which is always interesting to me that uh, the women followers followed Jesus um, on this day where the male followers had all scattered into hiding, or at least most of them. Continuing, Jesus turned to the women and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Rather, cry for yourselves and your children. The time will come when they will say, Happy are those who are unable to become pregnant, the wombs that never gave birth, and the breasts that never nursed a child. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. If they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? They also led two other criminals to be executed with Jesus. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they, cru they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They drew lots as a way of dividing up his clothing. Pause. Um, there's going to be a, a little bit of a promotion, and you might say, uh, advance warning. Um, in Lent of 2021, which really isn't that far away, um, we're going to be, in fact, February, is, middle of February is when Lent begins. We're going to be doing a, uh, our worship series is going to be on the seven last words of Christ. Uh, or we're, we're going to call them cross words. Um, and so... We're going to be reading a couple of them here. I'm going to give you a couple things about them. I'm not going to go into depth. And you'll have to return for that worship series in Lent in order to hear more. Um, but so they say, Father, forgive them. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That's one of the first, that's the first word, uh, at least in Luke's, that Jesus says from the cross. They drew lots as a way of dividing up his clothing. Most clothing was was uh, woven, and they didn't want to tear it apart. What good is it if once you tear it apart? Um, so they wanted to kind of just, you know, you get the tunic, and I get the underclothes, whatever, that kind of thing. The people were standing around watching, but the leaders sneered at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he really is the Christ, 
sent from God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you really are the king of the Jews, save yourselves. Above his head was a notice of the formal charge against him. It read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging next to Jesus insulted him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Responding, the other criminal spoke harshly to him. Don't you fear God, seeing that you've also been sentenced to die? We are rightly condemned, for we are receiving the appropriate sentence for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. Pause, because that's the second word of Jesus. Uh, again, not going to spend a whole lot on this because uh, then you'll be bored when you join me in, in Lent. Because uh, I'll be talking about the criminals and what, what that really meant and what they were. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about what Jesus says here. Now, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview, though. Because uh, two things. Uh, now, the common English Bible, which is what I read, says, uh, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. Many other translations don't use the word that, uh, and they use a comma. They use a comma, and it says, I assure you, or uh, however, whatever, some wording like that. I assure you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. Here's the thing with translations uh, from one language to another, especially from ancient Greek to modern English. Um, most of the times we have to guess at punctuation. There's very, very limited punctuation in ancient Greek. There's even less in, in ancient Hebrew, virtually none in, in the oldest of the uh, Old Testament texts. So when we put in a comma, sometimes we're guessing. So I'm going to move the comma, and I've talked about this before but with a different passage, but I'm going to move the comma one place, one word. All right, I'm going to read it the way it's usually translated, and I'm going to move it one way, one, one word, and see what kind of difference it makes. I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Right? Meaning, today you're going to be with me in paradise. But let's move the comma one spot. I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Ah. Do you catch the difference there? With that second reading, moving the comma one word, uh, it, it's not it's it's no longer saying that it's going to happen today, you being with me in paradise, but it's more of a uh, of an offer of consolation. I assure you today, and a promise for the future, you will be with me in paradise. I, I like both of those translations. I can get comfort from both of those those statements. Uh, whether the comma is in one spot or the other. Um, however, by moving it that one spot, um, some folks, it fits in better with some theology uh, some and some theologians thinking as far as, you know, uh, the, the, the resurrection of the body um, and that w what happens to us after death and that there might be this pause before we actually are with Jesus. Uh, but that's that's both both translations work too because uh, I just answered somebody's question. <laughs> You're welcome there, dear. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that word paradise. That word paradise, which you know we might have this picture of of uh, you know clouds and harps and and all that kind of thing or whatever. Literally. Literally, uh, paradise means king's garden. King's garden, and it's a, so it's I think it's king's garden, and it's a protected garden, a walled-in garden. Uh, so I'm not going to say a whole lot about that because, like I said, then you won't have to pay attention when I give that sermon in a, in a few months, uh, or what I'm planning on saying in a few months. But just uh, something for you to think about. Something for you to think about. All right, continuing. Um, we're getting there. This is verse 44. So it's chapter 23, verse 44. It was now about noon. 
and darkness covered the whole earth until about three o'clock, while the sun stopped shining. Then the curtain in the sanctuary tore down the middle. Crying out in a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I entrust my life. Yes, one of the other words of Christ. After he said this, he breathed for the last time. Pause. So yeah, that was another one of Jesus' words. I'm not going to talk about it right now. And yes, your translation might say something different. Into your hands I entrust my life. Into your hands uh, I, I give my spirit. Or There's all different translations to it. They're all technically accurate. But we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, and Luke, Matthew goes into some more detail. Matthew is the... Matthew is very heavy on the supernatural. Um, it's like he thinks that the story by itself isn't enough, almost. Luke, Luke gives passing uh, to this. The, the important thing about the tearing of this, uh, this curtain in the sanctuary is, is what it represents, is what it represents. Because the, the, the t this curtain in the sanctuary kept the Holy of Holies, the place, the seat of God, apart from the people. Only certain people could go through the curtain, um, and usually only limited number of times and when they could do it. So uh, the curtain being torn, and it says, and Luke says torn down, um, and I believe Matthew says torn down, like from the top, meaning from the top down, which if you've ever tried to tear something that's been hanging, I mean, it's hard enough to tear something that's been hanging, that's ha that is hanging, from the bottom, where you're able to grab hold of both of it. But when something's hanging in, on some sort of rod or, or rope, and you're trying to tear it, it's impossible. So it's supernaturally being torn. So it's God breaking down this barrier between God and the people. Between God and the people. That's, that's the importance of it. And uh, although Luke's audience was substantially Greek and, or yeah, Gentile, um, and although Luke himself may very well have been Gentile, he would have understood. He, he we believe, we trust that he knew a lot about um, Jewish religion and belief, and uh, uh, and he would have understood that, and so would his audience. So would his audience or most, much of his audience, especially those who were Jewish. Anyway, continuing. Uh, when the centurion saw what happened, he praised God, saying, It's really true. This man was righteous. All the crowds who had come together to see this event returned to their homes, beating their chests after seeing what, happened, what had happened. Pause. Even though there's only a verse left in that section. So, all the crowds came together to see this event. Event. It was something to see. It was something to see. It was something to be a part of. Uh, they didn't have a whole lot to do, so, ooh, let's go watch somebody die. However, when, uh, when faced with the, the supernatural aspects of the, de of the day and of the event, the fact that it got dark uh, for a period of time, the sun didn't shine, the... It, that uh, there's words of the, the curtain being torn. And, of course, Matthew throws in an earthquake. Like I said, Matthew, Matthew is the gospel in sense around, or, or the gospel on steroids. Um, but faced with all of that, and maybe it made them, maybe that was like a mirror for them to look into and realize their part in it. And uh, now, now that their bloodlust has been... Um, has been, been answered, been, been drained, been released... Uh, they're, they're feeling grief and shame over what they have participated in. Continuing, And everyone who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance observing these things. Now, there was a man named Joseph who was a member of the council, religious council, he was a good and righteous man. He hadn't agreed with the plan and actions of the council. He was from the Jewish city of Arimathea and eagerly anticipated God's kingdom. This man went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Taking it down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth 
and laid it in a tomb carved out of the rock in which no one had ever been buried. It was the preparation day for the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was quickly approaching. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph. They saw the tomb and how Jesus' body was laid in it. Then they went away and prepared fragrant spices and perfumed oils. They rested on the Sabbath in keeping with the commandment. That ends the chapter. But I'll mention a couple things about this this section, this passage. Yeah, you know, got Joseph um, put in, take, claiming Jesus' body. He was a religious leader, but he didn't go along with the rest of the group. He thought everybody else was wrong. And so he claims Jesus' body uh, in the open. Uh, doesn't He's never mentioned before, so if he was any kind of a follower of Jesus, we don't know. But if he was, it would have been uh, in hiding, in hiding. He was on the down low kept his uh, relationship with Jesus. Or maybe he just, maybe he wasn't a follower of Jesus. Maybe he just was struck by the uh, illegality of the of all of the proceedings and uh, felt that it was just wrong, uh, that they were violating God's laws and uh, wanted to do something nice for this guy that had been wronged in so many ways. And so he claims Jesus' body and he puts him in a tomb. No. Tradition says it, it's his tomb. Luke doesn't say that. And I don't remember if the other Gospels say that or not. John might I'll have to look at that. Um, but the fact, that, but he does put him in a new tomb. You know, we might think, well, of course it's a new tomb, right? We don't really do it other than that. I mean, there's certain occasions, perhaps. Um, but in ancient times, it was a very common practice to use the same tomb multiple times. Um, a body would be placed in there, allowed to decompose, and then the bones would be collected, uh, put in a, a stone box, which is called an ossuary, or a bone box, um, and then a new body would be placed in the old tomb. Uh, so Luke puts in this detail of this being a new tomb uh, well, for, for a very big, important reason, for a very important reason, uh, so that once the resurrection takes place, which is going to be coming up tomorrow, that's a spoiler alert for you, um, no one can say that his body was just uh, moved by accident, confused with somebody else's or, or something like that. No, because there's no bones left and this was a new one. So there's no there's no mixing of bodies. There's no mixing of bodies. This is, this one was definitely Jesus, and now it's gone. Um, so Joseph wraps him in that white linen white linen cloth and puts him in the tomb. It's not exactly how a body is supposed to be prepared, but it was the best he could do because remember this is this is uh, Friday afternoon. It's it's getting close to sundown, and sundown on Friday would be uh, would be the Sabbath would be the Sabbath. So it's uh, getting close to Sabbath time. Um, they, so he does the best he can. It was the, yeah, see, it was the preparation day for the Sabbath. So it's it's Friday afternoon. We're getting close. Sabbath starts sundown on Friday, runs till sundown on Saturday. And the same thing for the ladies. They would be the ones doing the preparation of the body. They're the ones that have to do the oils and the spices. So they go and they get all the stuff. And, uh, but after first they go and make sure they know where Jesus' body is. They want to be able to get back there. They don't want to have to try to guess or, or anything like that. Um, but they can't do it right then and there because of the timing, because of the timing. And Luke says they, they took off on, they, they didn't do it on the Sabbath. They didn't do it on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was, like I said, Friday night until sundown Friday until sundown on Saturday. Uh, they wait until the next morning, Sunday morning, uh, to go uh, and go about their business of preparing the body, which is what we will get to tomorrow. But this that 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 goes back to very early in our our talks when we were talking about days and weeks and stuff like that. Um, I forget when exactly we were talking about that somewhere around chapter five or six. Um, that today counts as a day in the first century, the way they counted things. So when you know, we say that Jesus was in the tomb for three days, and from our point of view, it wasn't. It's like two days, you know, because it was not even a full two days. But counting even part of a day, 
and you count with today. That's how the first century did it, uh, especially Middle Eastern cultures. So it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, even though he was only there for part of the day on Friday. Um, the other thing that's important about the three days is there was a belief, um, and it, it ties in with the uh, Greek Greek philosophy, Greek thought, that the spirit. Um, it's, it's Greek. It's what's called Greek dualism. We'll talk about it at some point, I'm sure. Uh, but that the body is good, and the or the body is bad, and the spirit is good, and uh, that at death they separate. But the spirit hangs around, kind of near the body for three days, and can come back into the body. Uh, but after three days, it can't. It's gone. So that's. That's why, that's another reason why the three days is important. Uh, it contradicted, it goes against uh, Greek dualism, combats this idea of Greek dualism. Um, and, and especially by pointing out the fact that the body is important because Jesus is resurrected bodily. Uh, <laughs> that was a lot of talking there. So I gave you some previews for uh, this time, not for our next series on uh, all all you need to know about the end times, but for our series on crosswords, uh, which we'll be doing in a few months in Lent. Uh, yes, so one more day here with uh, with our readings, and then I am taking a break. Like I said, I have those couple thoughts, maybe looking at uh, the book of, of Acts, going one chapter, chapter by chapter, uh, or just reading the Bible uh, with you a little bit every day um, without my commentary, which is going to be hard, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it's going to be, and uh, you know, if you wanted to send some comments on those, suggestions, if you wanted a different book of the Bible to go through, I will consider your uh, your suggestions and your input before making a decision. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, tomorrow will be our last day going through Luke. <coughs> tomorrow afternoon, of course, at four thirty, the uh, children's family worship experience will be. Uh, will be uploaded to Facebook, and you can watch that at any time. It's about a half an hour, like 20, 24 minutes, I think, is exactly what it is, a little video of a bunch of things put together. Um, and then at 9.30 is our worship experience, but tune in at 9.15, uh, because we'll have some pre-worship uh, music, some organ music, as well as an art, uh, a sand art video that's taking place. So uh, help you focus and get ready and uh, have your candles ready and your communion elements, bread or wine, uh, crackers and juice or wine, something like that. Have a blessed day. I hope everything, uh, hope this has been beneficial and I will see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>